years, especially oh, great. recording in progress. Um, these these over the course of these past couple years, I think we've all been uh, sort of just a second, got it. I think we've all been kind of looking to nature uh, for, you know, for solace, to make us feel better, to make us let, feel less alone. And I know that for me personally, birding has really helped with my mental health, especially the past couple of years. And um, it's just made me feel more excited about, about everything really. Even, even in those early days of the pandemic when we couldn't go anywhere, it seemed like, everything was canceled except, except for spring migration. And I wrote this piece for the Globe and Mail um, all, all about that, that everything around us is canceled except for the birds. So the birds really gave me a reason to get out there and to feel happy again. And it also, it also made me feel like life was continuing in spite of this weird um, kind of limbo that, uh, you know, that we were all inhabiting because of the early days of COVID. So um, this, this talk is going to be a little bit about my book, um, this memoir I wrote called Field Notes from an Unintentional Birder. And the book is really about how, uh, you know, birds enabled me to see the world through a completely different lens. Um, in fact, it is through birds that I really learned how to see. So I'm going to be talking a little bit, um, a little bit about, about my book, um, since it's, you know, the book is also about a midlife love affair with birds that made me see the world differently, and that really made me see the world with more, with more wonder. Um, so that's, that's that's kind of the, the focus of, of what I'm going to be talking about today. So a little bit about my journey um, as, a, as a writer and also a little bit about the birds, uh, the birds that I love and why, why they inspire me, uh, why they inspire me so much. So um, just one second. For some reason, my slides aren't advancing. Oh, here we go. Um, so this this is an image of me um, in Cape May, New Jersey. Here I am. For me, birding is really all about the practice of looking, of really learning to see the world in all of its glorious detail. And I think even more important than that, for me, birding has really been about learning to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. And it's interesting because before, before I discovered birds and before, you know, before I became a birder, I really believed that um, one had to go far away from the city in order to, to find nature. So I live in Toronto, <laughs> huge metropolis, and never in a million years did I think that there was so much nature all around me. I really believe that, you know, you have to go up to cottage country or better yet to the Swiss Alps or something exciting in order to find uh, the beauty of nature. And birding really opened my eyes to the fact that nature is all around us. We just have to take the time to look. So falling in love with birds really changed the way I see my, uh, I, I see my surroundings. Um, and that in turn gave me a new way of being in the world. So that's kind of what I, what I explore in, uh, in my memoir. Um, and this photo was, uh, was taken by, by my husband, my, my poor long suffering spouse. He was once referred to as an SOB, um, by, uh, you know, by one of our bird guides in Arizona. And we, when we kind of stared at the bird guide in disbelief, he was like, oh, it just means spouse of a birder. <laughs> So um, my, my beloved SOB took this photo. And uh, interestingly enough, he too has experienced a little bit of a birding conversion um, thanks, to, thanks to the pandemic. That was perhaps the biggest silver lining for me is that uh, you know, the pandemic really forced my husband to fall in love with birds and to, jo to join me on all my wild and crazy adventures, except I am planning to go to Manitoulin on, um, on Saturday to chase 
release the Lewis's woodpecker and he has vetoed that trip, but who knows, things might change. Um, anyhow, um, you might be wondering over the course of this presentation, why there are no photos of me as a young child with birds or in nature, because when a lot of people talk about their birding journeys, they start with like, oh, and I saw my first bird when I was seven and fell in, fell in love with it and whatever. But my story is pretty different. I saw my first bird, the red winged blackbird, uh, my beloved spark bird. I saw my first bird at the age of 35. Um, and, you know, it was this gorgeous thing that made me stop dead in my tracks. And when I saw this red winged blackbird, I thought, oh my God, what is this rare, extraordinary creature? And so you do have to understand that I grew up very much indoors. Like I had a really indoor upbringing. My parents are concert pianists. Um, I, I was born in the former Soviet Union. We came to Canada when, when I was four and a half. And, you know, my mother, my parents, my family just didn't do nature. Like we didn't do the outdoors. My mother always said the outdoors are for other people. Um, and so, you know, I grew up going to the opera, the symphony, visiting museums and nature was just not something we did. And so when I discovered birds, it was really my gateway to the natural, um, you know, to the natural world. And it really, seeing this first red winged blackbird really did crack my world open. And, you know, when I saw this bird, I, I turned to the people I was birding with, like my new bird group, and I said, oh my God, is this a, is this a rare migrant from Peru? Because, you know, I, I knew that pigeons existed and I had heard about owls, but that was really it. I mean, when I started birding, I was completely a blank slate. Some people say that, um, you know, some people call themselves beginners and what they mean is that they have a hard time distinguishing a fall plumage black pole warbler from a pole plumage bay breasted warbler, but I was not that kind of beginner. I mean, I really didn't know that birds existed. And so when I saw this bird, it was such a monumental event in my life. Um, and it really made me ask the question, oh my God, what else what else have I been missing? So I'm just going to read you a really, a really short paragraph from my book. This is from the chapter called Spark Bird. And of course, you all know that the spark bird is the bird that triggers somebody's lifelong passion or slash obsession. Um, so I'm just going to read the, the end of this chapter. Um, this, uh, this was when I went birding for the first time with a group that I had found online just by Googling, you know, birding group Toronto. And I actually picked the group that just had the most photos on the website uh, because I didn't really know what I was getting into. And I was kind of, initially, I was kind of more curious about the birders than the birds themselves. I was curious about who are these people who wear these multi-pocketed vests and talk about optics. Um, and the last thing in the world that I ever imagined was that I would become one of them and that these would be my people in a way. Um, so this was the end of my first outing and we, we went to um, we went to Colonel Sam Smith Park, which is a gorgeous park in Toronto, right, um, right on Lake Ontario. And we went in search of a Western grebe, which we found, which meant absolutely nothing to me. And I was so bewildered by this whole birding world that I ended up actually pointing my binoculars at the CN Tower instead of even looking at ducks because everything looked the same to me. Uh, but then something happened. Um, on our way back to the cars, my extremities frozen from standing still in gale-like winds, I wondered how many more hours of staring at dark blobs on the water I could withstand. Disenchanted, I was preparing my exit speech to the group. When we stopped near a bush and someone called out, Red Wing Blackbird. I almost didn't look because the thought of lifting the binoculars to my eyes brought with it a slight wave of nausea. But the bird stood still, balancing on a cattail, and I managed the trifecta of raising the binoculars, focusing them, and finding the desired object magnified in my field of vision. What is that? I gasped, 
nearly blinded by the unexpected vermilion patches on the blackbird's epaulets. I watched as the bird threw back its head, opened wide its beak, and let out a sound so primal it left me marveling. This was as close as I'd ever stand to dinosaurs. If this bird had been here all along, I thought, what else had I been missing? And so that question of what else ha have I been missing really started to trigger this very profound personal transformation. And that is essentially what, what my book is um, what my book is about. So the red winged blackbird wasn't just my gateway to birds, but it was also my gateway to nature and, um, and the outdoors. And it really is what set this obsession of mine in motion. Um, as I was writing my book about becoming an unintentional birder, I realized that so much of what I love about birding and being outdoors is that it really does make me feel good. Like when I'm looking closely and when I'm observing the detail of the world around me, recognizing wonder in my own surroundings, I can't help but feel happy. And then in December of 2020, there was a scientific study that came out in Germany that literally provided scientific evidence for the main thesis of my book. And, you know, the um, the scientific paper said that seeing a greater diversity of birds makes us demonstratively happier. And so I wrote about, um, about that scientific study. I wrote an essay about it for Audubon magazine in the United States. And my editor was thrilled to inform me that in the first week, the piece got over 30,000 hits. So clearly this was resonating with, with people. And then I kind of made a joke to my publisher that my book should have a sticker on it that says scientifically proven because, um, you know, more birds do bring more uh, more happiness. And I really do think that it is an antidote to, uh, you know, being outdoors, looking at nature really is an antidote to despair. And, you know, for those of you who have backyard uh, feeders, um, there is nothing more exciting than watching the drama unfold at your feeder. You know, it's almost like being in, um, in, a, in a middle school cafeteria again, the same social dynamics play out, you know, like the queen bees and the wannabes um, and the, you know, the, the little bullies and then of course there's always like a cooper's hawk lurking somewhere surveying the buffet and seeing what he can get his hands on so a lot of drama takes place at the theater it's it's all very very exciting um so here here are some images of, of me uh holding birds i um i started volunteering at a at a bird banding station here in toronto it's actually in downtown toronto it's at the leslie street spit it's called the Tommy Thompson Park Bird Research Station and I've been volunteering there for several uh, for several years now and you can see that in all of these photos whenever I am holding birds I am so I'm ecstatic uh, so here I am with a black and white warbler and also holding a a buffle head um, so this migration monitoring station where, where I volunteer, um, it operates in the spring and in the fall, and we trap birds in mist nets, and then we extract them, we weigh them, we sex them, we age them, and then we let them go really, really quickly. And then the data gets pooled from, um, you know, all of these North American banding stations, and basically the data is used to assess the health of uh, the general health of bird populations and also to assess migration patterns. And the data actually ends up being quite important both for ornithologists and for conservationists as well to see where, you know, where, where the needs are and how we can best help uh, these birds that are, of course, birds are indicators of, uh, you know, the health of our, uh, the health of our planet. Um, and here's, here's another image from uh, the, the banding station. These are two cedar waxwings that, um, that we're holding. 
And so, you know, I, I have to, I'm sure you all know this, but I need to stress this anyways, uh, you know, birds, birds are not hurt uh, in, in this process of banding them and holding them and handling them. Uh, everybody who volunteers at the banding station has been, uh, has been trained and, you know, the birds, the health of the birds and the safety of the birds always, uh, always comes first. So that's just an important, uh, an important thing I need to mention. And the, the reason I'm showing you these cedar wax wings is because the cedar wax wing is the first bird that I ever extracted from a mist net. And as I mentioned before, I did not grow up with nature. Like I, you know, we didn't have pets when I was, uh, when I was growing up. And so in many ways, volunteering at the bird banding station was about, in a way, conquering my own trepidation and my own fear about the outdoors. And I do have to say that I'm a bit of a slow learner. It took me several years to muster up the courage to hold a bird. Um, and so, you know, when, when I was holding these birds, it was the first time I took the plunge and actually extracted a bird. And I joked with my fellow volunteers that the banding station was, in a way, bravery school for me. And so I write about my, my experiences at the bird banding station in, uh, in my memoir. Um, and, you know, if, if, you read, if you read my book, you will notice that I, I am not a scientist. I'm not an ornithologist. I'm above all a writer. And in a way, I commit the cardinal scientific sin of anthropomorphizing and sort of, you know, seeing human qualities in, in birds. Scientists would never do that. And what I particularly love about these cedar wax wings is their extraordinary hairdos. Um, you know, this, this, is, this is a bird that just has, has, has great hair. And, um, you know, I'm one of these people who, you know, sometimes my hair doesn't look great. I get self-conscious about my hair. So I really marvel at the, the cedar wax wing that just always looks so elegant. Um, so I'm just gonna read you a tiny passage about, um, about these birds that I have fallen in love with and the way I anthropomorphize them. So it isn't scientifically right to anthropomorphize, to see yourself in a bird. Um, connecting with birds as if they were humans. And yet that's how I fell in love with them and started to see them as part of my own landscape. Because after a few years of looking through binoculars, I started seeing birds everywhere. And if asked who I most wanted to resemble, I would have to say it in bird speak. I'd like a cedar wax wings hairdo a northern flicker's intrepid sense of style, a Ross's goose's superlative con confidence, the mellifluous singing voice of a wood thrush, a belted kingfisher's singular glare, a winter wren's capacity to be heard, a northern gannet's fierce single-minded determination, a black and white warbler's awesome classic elegance and a red winged blackbird's ability to make a first impression. <laughs> So um, there, there you go. That's that's how I would like to uh, how I would like to be defined. Um, here is another another photo from the bird banding station. Uh, we call we call this a wonderful uh, warbler party. And what you can see here is a black black throated blue warbler, in northern perula, two northern perulas, and three magnolia uh, magnolia warblers. So. For me, volunteering at a bird banding station has just been extraordinary, and you know it has given me the uh, the amazing privilege of seeing migration up close. Um, and you know it's it's hard to believe that in in just a couple months, all these little guys are gonna you know start coming back here. Uh, they're gonna they're gonna pass through on their way north uh, to breed. And so holding a bird in the hand and being able to feel its heartbeat, I really consider that an enormous privilege and a responsibility um, you know, that, I, that I don't take lightly. And it also showed me firsthand about the extraordinary miracle of migration. These warblers weigh between six and 12 grams and they undertake absolutely perilous um, 
uh, migratory ma migratory flights. Um, one of my one of, one of the most miraculous migratory flyers uh, among the warblers is, of course, the black pole warbler. He's not on this uh, on this slide, but I'm sure you've all seen a black pole warbler uh, before. And they. Um, they 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 managed to fly twenty thousand kilometers in uh, in a year, and their fall migration is particularly extraordinary because they will fly from the eastern seaboard, like from Nova Scotia ish, all the way down to their uh, wintering grounds in Colombia and Venezuela, and they will do that as a continuous flight. In other words, they fly for three days straight without stopping. And that's pretty extraordinary when you think of a black pole warbler that weighs approximately 12 grams. So I am absolutely in awe of these uh, migratory, uh, migratory flyers. I'm in awe of their tenacity. I'm in awe of, you know, their intrepid, uh, intrepid nature uh, and of their, of their fierce determination. And I'm always so inspired by their resilience. Uh, so I mentioned the black hole warbler. Um, perhaps the um, the champion uh, flyer of all migratory birds is the bar-tailed godwit. And scientists have just discovered the um, uh, the the, the bar-tailed godwit that that flew the largest distance. So they managed to measure it through uh, satellite and um, the devices. And so this particular bar-tailed godwit flew uh, 13,560 kilometers without stopping from Alaska all the way down to Tasmania. Um, and it flew for 11 days straight without stopping, which is, of course, a record. And it is absolutely, absolutely extraordinary. And what is so amazing about these migratory flyers is that, in a way, birds birds are like superheroes. They're like shapeshifters. Because in order to, uh, in order to undertake these extraordinary migratory flights, they actually have to kind of rearrange all of their internal organs um, in, in their body. And, you know, scientists call it uh, strategic restructuring. So basically, their livers and kidneys and all their guts shrink uh, in order to lighten the load for their migratory journey. And actually, their sexual organs shrink as well. Uh, basically, they're like you know the size of a little pin because, of course, they don't they don't need them, especially during fall migration when they're when they're traveling uh, traveling all the way all the way south. So everything shrinks, and then their heart and their chest muscles expand because they need that for their long distance flight. So the fact that birds are actually these, you know, absolutely magical shapeshifters is extremely inspiring to me as well. And on these super long distance migratory flights, they also do another really cool thing where they're able to put half of their brain to sleep and to use the other half of their brain uh, for, you know, flight navigation. So this is called unihemispheric sleep. So the more I learn about bird migration, Migration, the more I am in awe of these, you know, these extraordinary, um, extraordinary creatures that uh, just manage these superhuman feats in a way. And what I write about in my book as well um, is that the more I studied about, the more I learned about migration and the more time I spent at the banding station holding these uh, migratory birds, the more I started to think about my own families' migrations. Like I was born in the Soviet, in the former Soviet Union. And even before I was born, my family had migrated throughout the Soviet Union because uh, my family is Jewish. And so, you know, during, during the Second World War, um, they, they were evacuated to Central Asia. And so I started thinking about my family's migratory journeys and really thinking of myself as a migratory species. And in a way, what birding helped me discover um, was uh, the beauty of my own home. And it made me look at this place that I live uh, with, with more wonder and with more appreciation. Um, 
So here is just another image of me at the banding station. Here I am holding a, uh, a red-breasted nuthatch. Um, and this picture was, was, taken, uh, was taken last fall. And here is just the inside of the banding station. This is uh, where we process the birds. What I mostly do is I scribe. This is my absolute favorite job in the world because I get to see all the birds that are processed. Uh, and I get to write down all the science scientific data. And so here my friend, my friend Linda is uh, banding a yellow-bellied sapsucker. That's what she has in her hand. And what you can see in the um uh, in the in the right hand of this image uh, are the bags that we put the birds into. So when we extract them, we put them into one of these cotton bags just so that the bird calms down a little bit. And then we hang the bags on pegs as we process the birds. Uh, and then you can see a little black tube sticking sticking out right under the bags. That's how we let the birds go. Uh, we just uh, put them in the black tube and they are really happy to fly out. Uh, sometimes we, we do pose for glamour shots with them uh, when there is something very exciting or when there is an extraordinary celebrity, uh, celebrity bird that comes through the station. Um, this is just a funny image that I wanted to share with you. Uh, a few years ago, I guess four or five years ago now, the waters of Lake Ontario rose quite a bit and there was quite a bit of flooding, but that didn't stop us from, uh, um, you know, opening the banding station and still doing a migration monitoring season. Uh, but we did have to do it in hip waders. <laughs> um, so when, when my book was published, the Toronto Star ran an article about me and uh, the editor emailed me and asked, for photos of me in action. So I sent them all these photos of me holding birds. And then I sent this as a joke. Um, and of course, this is the picture that they blew up that, you know, took up half the page. So this is uh, my bird banding chic uh, fashion. Um, and yeah, and people often ask, what is your favorite bird? And that's a really, really hard question for me to answer. But I think if I had to answer, it would probably be the American woodcock because the American woodcock is one of the strangest birds I have ever seen in my life. I am completely fascinated by bird behavior and especially just the oddities of bird behavior. And this, this bird kind of ticks off all the boxes for, you know, extremely, extremely weird. So I'm going to read another passage from my book about the American woodcock. If I could get a bird inked on my body, it would be the American woodcock, the largest North American shorebird, which hangs out mostly on damp ground in the woods, perfectly camouflaged with its surroundings. To me, the bird resembles an accident of nature. Its eyes grotesquely close together, perched high up on its head, giving it almost 360 degrees of vision for detecting predators and a long ultra sensitive bill for probing the ground for worms that it cannot see. Stocky, short legged, incessantly pouting, this is a bird with attitude. And yet the American woodcock is also one of the more curious Don Juans of the avian world. In early spring at dusk, the bird engages in an aerial mating dance that counts among the more peculiar things that I have ever seen. The aerial display of the woodcock is so odd that many birding clubs host outings just to bear witness to the bird's eccentric pre-mating performance. It begins with a nasal ping, repeated more times than strictly necessary. And if a nasal note weren't enough to get a girl going, what follows is nothing short of spectacular. The pouty, stocky woodcock hurls himself high into the ether on whistling wings, ascending in a series of wide circles as if he had suddenly developed the agility of a nymph. And then he plummets to the ground with a yelp and does the acrobatic feat all over again. These paints and aerial dances work like a charm in the spring. The American woodcock 
mates morning and night without fail for eight straight weeks. What female wouldn't be seduced by such a show? After witnessing the stocky bird's transformation into an aerial gymnast, even I could be convinced to mate with a woodcock. So there you go. That is, uh, that is my favorite bird. I had mentioned in the beginning of this talk that birds really taught me to see the extraordinary in the ordinary. Uh, this is a photo of a snowy owl that was taken in downtown Toronto. And before, you know, before I started birding, I never imagined that such a diversity of birds could be seen right here in my hometown. Um, and I never expected that living in Southern Ontario essentially means that you can see seven species of owls relatively easily. So again, nature is all around us. We literally just have to take the time, uh, take the time to look. Um, this is another one of my favorite birds. This is the belted, the belted kingfisher. And of course, when you take the time to look, you see all sorts of extraordinary things. Um, my husband took these photos uh, through our scope. He's gotten really into digiscoping, and we were we were looking at this amazing. Um, this amazing belted kingfisher in uh, Colonel Sam Smith Park, and suddenly another kingfisher flew, uh, you know, flew down next to him, and suddenly, oh my goodness, um, you know, he he was able to catch them in in flagrante mating right before our eyes. It was all lightning quick. Uh, it only lasted a few seconds, but you know, made a pretty great photo. So the pandemic has forced a people outside and birding has really been soaring in, uh, in popularity. There's all sorts of eBird data to, uh, to back this up. You know, Audubon, uh, Audubon ran some, some articles about um, uh, um, you know, bird baths and how they, they've been selling like never before and bird seed as well. Um, and in other, you know, that, I, I talked about uh, watching watching birds at your feeder and the, all of the excitement that that brings. And the more you watch, the more you see, and you never know what you're going to happen, uh, what you're going to happen upon. Um, and you know, I wrote another piece for Audubon magazine about the importance of appreciating our common birds. Like birding isn't just about chasing the rarity or finding, uh, you know, finding finding something something super exciting. It's also about falling in love with and noticing the nuance and the beauty uh, in our very common birds. Um, and, you know, when I say that birding is an antidote to despair, um, you know, I, I mean that very seriously. Yes, birds make us happier, but it's also important to recognize that birds are in trouble. And in fact, birds need us as much as we need them. Um, since 1970, we have lost almost 3 billion birds. And many of those birds that are disappearing are our common birds. So it's wonderful to see rarities, but the health of bird populations really depend on the protection that we offer the common birds in our midst. So that's become really important to me, to me too, to really, um, you know, to, to really spend time appreciating every single, every single bird, uh, every single bird I see. And the Kingfisher is a wonderful example of that. It is not a rarity. Um, it, you know, he's a, he's a regular in, in so many parks that I go to, but I feel like I, I look at him with, with, through different eyes now. Um, so birds are wonderfully communicative creatures, and I love imagining what they, you know, what, how they might be communicating, what they might be saying to one another. And occasionally a celebrity bird will appear and grace us with its presence. And uh, the yellow crown night heron, of course, was one of the big celebrity birds that came to Toronto a, a couple, a couple years ago. And I've been talking a lot about learning to appreciate 
um, just our common birds and the birds in our midst. And this is a pie-billed grebe in a park right next to my house and uh, also a northern shrike uh, that we found, you know, just a couple, a couple kilometers away, away from, away from our house in, in Downsview, uh, in Downsview Park. So again, nature is all around us. You really don't have to travel far to see, uh, to see extraordinary things. And um, these are two of my favorite owl photos. This is a, a great horned owl who looks a little bit sleepy or maybe a little bit drunk. I don't know what's going on here. Uh, and a extraordinary short eared owl that we saw also in Downsview Park. And check out the owls, uh, the owls pedicure, uh, pedicure right here. Um, and what what I've, uh, you know, what, I, what I've learned as, as I've become a birder is that there are so many different ways to be a birder and that there is no right way to be a birder. I think, um, you know, I had a, had a little bit of a crisis um, as, you know, as I was trying to figure out, well, who am I? Am I the backyard birder who just kind of sits there and contemplates whatever, whatever comes to the theater? Or am I going to be the chaser? Or what kind of birder am I going to be? And then, you know, I just kind of sat back and relaxed a little bit and realized that, you know what, there's no right way to do it. Uh, as long as you are looking at birds, um, cultivating this habit of looking, as long as you're finding pleasure in the natural world like that already that already makes uh makes you uh makes you a um makes you a birder and um you know bird i really believe that birding develops um it develops empathy because when we look closely at something and when we consider all of its nuances and all of its detail, we start to care more and we start to fall in love with what we are looking at. We start to take pleasure in, in what we see. And when we care about something, we are more invested in, uh, in protecting it. Um, and so through my own writing, I have been doing a lot of journalism lately about conservation issues and just spreading more awareness about how to help birds and um, you know just how, how to how to help uh, habitat restoration and just sort of using my authorly voice a little bit more in the service of birds. I really believe that the first step to conservation is of course love and care and I believe that as birders and as nature enthusiasts we have a mission to make other people care about the creatures we love so much and see uh, you know, see the wonder in them as well. And again, when you care about something, then you do more to protect it. And of course, that sort of goes hand in hand with what Marlene was saying uh, about Guelph nature and about your goals as a club. So I think that is really uh, important, just sort of spreading the motivation to um, help protect these, these birds who also uh, need us. So just a couple more photos about extraordinary birds that I've seen uh, near, you know, near my house. Um, this is a, you know, great blue heron, very, very common bird. And here the great blue heron was exhibiting some really bizarre sadistic behavior. Um, he was attacking this fish, but he didn't, you know, he didn't just attack the fish once or twice. He kept piercing the fish with its bill and then dropping it and grabbing it and you know piercing it again over and over again uh so it was uh, it was pretty pretty fascinating thing to witness and here is a gorgeous bluebird uh just being absolutely uh absolutely stunning so again, you know, birds gave me a new way of seeing the world and also a new way of seeing my own city. And in a way, Toronto has completely transformed for me. It's changed from this you know, this concrete jungle into a network of interconnected wildernesses. Uh, and again, you don't have to go far to, uh, to see nature. Um, and this is a, this is a photo uh, taken, taken from Tommy Thompson Park. Um, which uh, which is a beautiful accidental accidental wilderness um and you know birding has really shown me the importance of 
protecting what is right in front of us. Um, and the, you know, that's, that's something we have to fight for um, constantly. And what Birding has really taught me and what I write a lot about in this memoir is how birds taught me to love where I am. And they really taught me to, to be present and to appreciate the present uh, the present moment, and to also appreciate what is right in front of me, instead of looking for something bigger, better, greater. And you know, I always I always joke that in a way. Um, you know, birding, birding saved my marriage <laughs> because when, uh, you know, when you, when you look at a bird, you really have to look at it in all of its nuance in order to appreciate it. And the most common error that beginner birders make is that instead of looking at what's in front of them, they look at what they wish were it was in front of them. So in a way, birds taught me to look at the person in front of you and appreciate what you got. Um, and yes, that did improve my marriage. So, you know, birds, birds help on, on all sorts of levels. Um, and before, before I finish, I just wanted to share this wonderful quote with you. I love this book by Simon Barnes. He's British. He's actually a sports writer, but also a birder. And he wrote this wonderful book called How to Be a Bad Bird Watcher. And in a way, this book, um, uh, this, you know, this this book sort of uh, gave me the confidence to um, just to be the birder I am, and not to not to try to be the correct birder. And so, what he writes is, bird watching is a state of being and not an activity. It is about life, and it is about living. It is the habit of looking. And I think that's what we all try to cultivate, this habit of looking. And I swear it makes you a better person because it makes you more empathetic. And in a way, birding, um, birding isn't just an antidote to despair. It's also an antidote to smugness. Because whether you like it or not, birding always keeps you humble because as a birder you're constantly learning and you're constantly making mistakes you know I talk in this book I also talk about how in a way birding is also about befriending failure and about learning to appreciate the misidentifications because that actually helps you help helps you learn and helps you figure stuff out um, and of course birding makes you more attuned to the minute differences, uh, you know, in plumage and also, you know, just to the minute differences also between between people, uh, between people as well. Um, and I just want to end end this uh, end this talk uh, with one of my favorite um, an image of one of my favorite graffiti artists here in Toronto. I have no idea who this person is, but they run around the city uh, writing in French, tout est possible, everything is possible. And for me, birding has given me so much optimism. And going out birding for me is, in a way, a radical act of hope. Um, and even, even today, you know, in this, in this strange era we are living in, and the cycle of horribly depressing news, and the horribly depressing news is both about our, the state of our planet and also the horrible things people are doing to one another all over the world. I find hope in the act of birding and looking at birds almost every day. You know, just going out, looking at birds reminds me that beauty exists in the world and wonder too. So whenever I go out birding, I really do feel like anything is possible. Uh, and if you want to find out more information about me, feel free to look at, uh, have a look at my website. And if you want to contact me um, at any point, there's a contact button there. And I love hearing from, uh, from, from readers. I, I always write back. And again, my book was, it's called Field Notes from an Unintentional Birder. It was published by Douglas and McIntyre in 2020. Uh, it's available in bookstores and on Amazon. And finally, as a 
final thank you. I would like to thank uh, Zeiss uh, for supplying me with wonderful optics. And I am, you know, I am the Canadian, a Canadian brand ambassador for uh, Zeiss. They, they make wonderful, wonderful products. And I need to thank them for sponsoring me. And of course, thank you to Marlene and the um, and Nature of Wealth for inviting me. And it, it, this has been a wonderful pleasure. So I'm gonna open up the floor to questions uh, and I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions you have either about the book, the writing process or birding, uh, what, whatever. <laughs> I'm, gonna, I'm gonna stop my screen share right now. And thank you, thank you all so much. Great, thank you so much, Julia. That was uh, that was a really fantastic presentation. So I'll invite people to uh, write any questions in the chat. Uh, sorry, we, we turned the lights off in here so that we could see the screen a little bit better. So that's why it looks like I'm, I don't know, looks like I'm almost like a <laughs> getting lots of lighting from my from the computer. So uh, so a question here is, um, so so interesting and thank you. Any suggestions on how to get kids involved in birding? Oh my goodness, that is such that is such a great question. I'm kind of wrestling this with this uh, right now because my nephews are how old are they? They're seven and four, four and a half, and I've been trying very hard to get them to get them into uh, into birds um so we did we did make you know binoculars out of toilet paper rolls and that that got them pretty excited actually anything that's colorful kids are usually really uh really attracted by um last winter I had this absolutely horrible experience with my nephews I took them to Downsview Park because there had been you know the owls there were plentiful and there were all these long-eared owls hanging out you know for every day for two months and then I brought my nephews and the owls weren't there <laughs> and we traipsed through the snow for an hour and my older nephew was like I hate birds <laughs> but then after that you know we I sort of turned it into a learning opportunity and we wrote a book together about how we hate birds and then after that they were kind of more into it so I don't know what the answer is for for, for kids I don't have kids of my own but um I think color usually usually goes a long way and kids for some reason love love raptors um at least little little boys are really into them from 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 experience, I have uh, I have seen this. So um, this year, yeah, I finally did show them a snowy owl. So now they're I think I think they're good with birds. Um, yeah, yeah, and I'm taking uh, I'm taking a first time birder out on the weekend um, in the hopes of snowy owls. And so um, I know somebody today had just had messaged me to say like, oh hey, I saw a snowy owl being harassed by some crows in one of the parks here in Guelph, and I was like oh I'm like I don't even have to take them like that far but I'm like guaranteed they're probably gonna go out and probably not see any snow owls and they'll be like what you're supposed to be a birder you're supposed to know where the birds are and it's like I don't know I think one of the biggest lessons of birding too is patience and um and having patience is can is a big part of it um yeah so you mentioned um you mentioned the spark bird um and so I guess I'm curious a bit about, um, I haven't read that completely part of that, of your book yet, but I guess like what emotions or feelings that that spark bird like really bring, bring for you? Yeah, well, I think it was really, it was awe. I had never, I had never seen it. Um, or I, I had, basically I had never stopped to look at a bird before. And so it was, it was that, that moment of just being confronted with something extraordinary and something totally beautiful. And you just watching, watching the bird kind of like open, op open its bill. And you know, this, the song of the red winged blackbird is so distinctive uh, and also so kind of harsh and different from the birds, like beautiful, gorgeous plumage. So that contrast was, um, was amazing for me. But I think that, you know, the, the biggest thing about seeing the red winged blackbird is that I could actually see it and I could understand like the name made sense. We had been, I had been standing there and it was freezing cold. It was one of these like 
horribly freezing early April days. And we were standing there for two and a half hours staring at ducks. And this was my first birding outing ever. And all the ducks look completely identical. So I was so done with birding that day. And the last thing in the world I was expecting, you know, just as I was getting ready to leave is just to, to see this gorgeous bird and to be, to be stunned by it. And, um, you know, to just be mesmerized. So yeah, that's kind of the, um, all the emotions that, that happened at, at once. Yeah, and so maybe a follow-up question with that would be um, what, uh, so what was your next birding adventure like? Did you have high expectations for many red wings, blackbirds and? <laughs> well, the, the funny thing is, is that, um, you know, that that bird that was definitely my spark bird but then I didn't bird for a while after that uh basically you know I I, I wasn't sure whether uh whether birding birding was for me and I sort of took a break from birding but every time I would go to a park with my husband I'd be like oh that's a red wing blackbird that's a red wing blackbird and finally he was like maybe you need to learn a few more birds um and so I went back to the went back to the bird group and it you know it also coincided with spring migration so I started to get into the warblers and into um into that whole thing um and I I saw a great horned owl that kind of blew blew my mind as well um yeah um, yeah uh comment in the chat here so I'm halfway through your book and absolutely love your writing it's so personal engaging I'm a beginner birder myself, so I've had to Google quite a bit of the birds you have mentioned. Oh, wonderful. Um, you know, a really wonderful app that I'm sure most people are familiar with is, of course, Merlin. And that really helps with IDs and everything. Um, yeah, you know, I, I write a lot in this book about, about the trials and tribulations of birthing and about the difficulties as well. Um, and, you know, one of my, one of my first experiences during, during spring migration, my first spring migration was going out with my group and we were, you know, we were having lunch and somebody said, well, you know, what, what's your favorite bird that you saw today? And I said, oh, you know, the, the deer kill. <laughs> And everybody started laughing because, of course, I met Killdeer, and I got the I got the name wrong. So you know, I I, I write about. It. I write a lot about that um, as well. And what's what's fascinating about birding to me is that I started birding and I started playing badminton right roughly at the same time. And what was completely fascinating was the different attitude toward beginners um, that both activities have. And the extraordinary thing about birding is that birders love beginners because there's nothing a birder likes more than sharing enthusiasm right for for their favorite birds and also having the opportunity to relive that moment of seeing a bird for the first time so birders are so accepting of beginners and you know it's just a wonderful warm atmosphere and then like I would go to my badminton meetings at the at the local community center and when when I walked onto the badminton court everybody would like you know, just look away and be like, oh no, it's the beginner, we're gonna lose. So it was fascinating just to like li live out that contrast. Um, so I always tell people like bir birding is, it's the best place to be, to be a beginner because people will take you under their wing, pardon, pardon the pun. Yeah, and so question here from Cindy, approximately how many birds are banded at the station that you mentioned? Um, let's see, fall migration, we, we get a lot, I think, uh, close to 8,000, like a, a lot of birds, a lot more birds come through in the fall, also because the season is, is longer, like from August 1st to November 10th, and then the spring we usually get, uh, like close to, I think close to 5,000. Yeah. Uh, so the next question here from Rebecca. So how or where do you find birding community in your local community? 
Uh, oh, that, that's a wonderful question. So, I mean, there are a lot of birding, birding clubs, like kind of like Guelph Nature. We have the Toronto Ornithological Club and then the Ontario Field Ornithologist. That is an absolutely wonderful organization. Um, and their birding, their birding walks are free. There's a nominal membership fee that, um, that you can pay. So those are the, the, two, the two big ones. And then a lot of nature stores also offer their own walks. Um, so just a, a quick Google search will find you all sorts of options. And then there's also the Feminist Bird Club, which is a really great organization that is doing more and more, uh, more, more and more walks. So you kind of find people that way. And also, you know, if you're in a park and you see people with binoculars, if you ask them questions, chances are people will be pretty nice and they will, you know, they'll, they'll help you out and they'll point you in the right direction. So that's a lot of what I do now too, you know, when I, when I, when, whenever I'm out birding, I just scope out other people with binoculars um, and start talking to them. And soon enough, you have stuff in common. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I think I'm, uh, it's very interesting. I haven't been in this coordinator role for very long, but there's more groups too asking for like bird walks. And I think they recognize that people are like more interested in birds or just like, IDing birds. I, I feel like in the pandemic, it was like the peak for me for people sending me really bad blurry bird photos and asking me like, Mar, what's this bird? <laughs> I feel like, I don't know, take a better photo. <laughs> so, I love it. <laughs> oh man, it was really great. But it, I mean, it's fantastic when like more people are interested in birds. I think like much to your points in your presentation, like I think that interest in birds like make us more focused on like the needs of birds. So whether like that's habitat, um, where they're breeding, which is that big part of that breeding bird atlas as well too. Um, and then we learn more about them and what they need for for the like for them to survive into the future. So and hopefully we can be a little bit more uh, advocates for them as well. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll, oh, one last thing I wanted to mention in terms of that question about uh, where do you find birding community? You know, if if you're active online on Facebook, I think there are so many different birding birding groups um, that you can kind of like tap into, and that might be a good a good way to uh, meet others as well. So, yeah, 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 and. Um... Yeah, and even volunteer like volunteering, I'm sure as well too, because you mentioned volunteering with the band with the banding station, and I know some of us here volunteer with uh, doing bird counts at different properties, and um, that's a nice way to actually really meet somebody. Like I met my one of my birding partners through uh, volunteering and doing bird walks um, and doing counts and that, and it just like you know oh, we both yeah. get to develop our skills better and and that really helps as well too so yeah absolutely and i think um you know birds birds canada are often looking for volunteers for various projects like especially in the summer the piping plover uh project they're always looking for volunteers and they they train you and that would be an amazing way to meet people and they they're very accepting of beginners um because you know they, they provide the training as well so that's a really yeah it's a super great point Marlene, volunteer. Yeah, yeah. We're always looking for volunteers on the Breeding Bird Atlas. <laughs> so <laughs> beginners to experts, welcome. So we have lots of options for all different skill levels of birding. So, um, and I guess one question here was how to get involved with bird banding. And the right answer you have a um, yeah, that, that's an excellent question. So I, I would say if you want to get involved with bird banding, uh, there's a bunch of bird banding stations in, uh, in Ontario. Um, email, you know, email the whatever master, master banders, the bander in charge, they're called the BIC bander in charge, uh, email, email them, tell them about your experience, um, and yeah, try, try to, try to set that up. The, I, the, the caveat about volunteering with a bird migration station is in the spring, you, you do have to be there at like 4.30 in the morning. So that's just the caveat. Um, the banding protocol is you ban from uh, the, you open the nets half an hour before sunrise and they're open for six hours. 
So it is, it does take a chunk of time. Like every, every banding shift is, it's close to eight hours. So, you know, there's time commitment involved, but yeah, just reach out to the banders in charge. Most stations are always looking for volunteers. Great. Uh, are there any questions in the room here? Okay, Colin has a question. You gotta come over to the hot seat, so. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Uh, my question is, do you have a nemesis bird? Do I have a nemesis bird? Um, I always have a nemesis bird. So for a really long time, my nemesis bird was the pileated woodpecker. And then I saw it and had this out of body experience. And then I was super sad because like, what happens when you don't have a nemesis bird? Um, I felt this void suddenly. It was like, I, I saw this bird that I had been hoping to see for years and years. And, and suddenly, and so immediately, you know, I needed a new nemesis bird. Uh, so for the, a really long time, my nemesis bird was a yellow breasted chat. That. Got that one. And then the Bohemian waxwing had been eluding me for 10 years. And I finally, finally saw it and had another extraordinary experience. And right now, my nemesis bird is the black skimmer, which I should have seen in Cape May. Why I didn't see it, I don't know. So black skimmer is a nemesis and also blue-headed grosbeak. That was is that even what it's called? Blue-headed grosbeak? Blue grosbeak? Blue, blue something grosbeak. Is it blue-headed? Is there a blue -headed? Anyway, I hope that's what it's called, but I really want to see it. <laughs> there you go, we all know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anybody yeah, else? I think it's really important to always have a nemesis bird. You always want to be looking forward to that next best thing. But there is this moment when you see it, when you're like, Oh no, now, now what? I'm never gonna have that moment of seeing it for the first time again. And they're like, there's this tiny bit of loss. Birding is a very emotional business. I think that's what I hadn't realized when I started. Actually, you know, when I started birding, I really thought that, okay, you know, I'll do spring migration. Everyone's talking about spring migration, it'll be cool. And I thought that, all right, you do it once, you do it twice, and then you've done it, right? I totally didn't expect that it would, well, first of all, that I would become obsessed, but also that it gets better every year because you know more birds. So it's almost like you're being reunited with, with old friends. And I didn't expect the emotional investment that one would feel. <laughs> there really are a lot of ups and downs. Yes, there are. And I know you can relate to that. <laughs> yeah, yes, okay. Anyone else? Oh, there's just one more quick question in the room here. Hey, Julia, thanks. Great chat. Uh, just Hi, a the thought came to me. Um, so to be like pro bird, do you have not to start like a war amongst animal lovers, but do you have to be like anti cat in some sense, or at least like outdoor anti outdoor cat? A, a little bit. They they kill so many birds. I mean, so many of my birder friends are are cat people, but they keep their cats indoors. Yeah, I think it's a problem with like the feral cats are a huge problem, and it's just like out. There's really no reason for the cat to be outdoors or keep it on a leash or do something. Um, but yeah, I you know I think the bird the bird community and the cat community. They have, a, they have a lot in common. We, we can we can get along. Yeah, agreed, agreed. All right, great, thanks. That's, thanks, Julia. Um, so I think that'll be, that we'll call that for tonight. So I wanted to thank you for coming and well, coming on Zoom and, and doing this presentation for our group at Nature of Wealth. Um, it was very enjoyable. And, and I do agree too. Like I think, um, like through through the pandemic and all those lockdowns, like birds were the constant, and so like you can guarantee to be able to go out and look at birds. <laughs> so you might not, you know, sometimes in the winter you might be like, wow, this is like there's like five chickadees. That's amazing. After I walk five kilometers, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, so thank you so much for inspiring us and, um, and hopefully inspiring other people to get into birding and 
yeah, I would recommend people I haven't read the whole book yet, but from what I've read initially, um, it's it's very entertaining and I think probably really connects with a lot of people are probably on the call here tonight. So oh, thank, thank you so much and thanks so much for having me. This was this was such a pleasure. Yeah, thank, thank you. And we'll call the meeting to a close there. So everybody have a have a good night and uh, we'll see you at uh, the, the next Nature Guelph uh, event that you attend.